my name is Will. I know some of you are thinking, are you sure Mason actually walked off the stage? Because we can be confusing, especially when we wear our classic uniform of blue check and blue pants, but he did. Um, so I'm Will, I'm the student director here at Rio, and this morning we are going to continue in our series in the book of Mark, and we're going to come up to Mark 8, which is the linchpin in the book, and we started out early on saying, okay, the first eight chapters, we're going to look at the identity of who Jesus is. In the last eight chapters, we're going to follow Jesus on what is his mission here on this earth. And Mark 8 is going to be the passage that holds these two together. So, so let's do a little bit of recap of where we've been because it's actually pretty simple. Week after week, the past seven weeks, we've come to the book of Mark. And we've seen miraculous things. Miracle after miracle, teaching after teaching. But the main point of each and every one, each and every week we came to, we said Jesus is... Perfect. Tom would have been so sad on the front row if we didn't get that, but we did, so good work. Mark has been screaming at us through a megaphone in all of this. Each and every week we've come and said, okay, Jesus is God. Okay, Jesus is God. Okay, Jesus is God. And we've highlighted it and we've underlined it and we've circled it. And that seems like a lot. It seems like, hey, well, we got the point probably at week three. But the truth is, this is the greatest truth that we can come to terms with. That Jesus is truly God. And I think A.W. Tozer put it best when he said this. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And that's why we spent all of these weeks saying Jesus is God. And today we're going to see that who Jesus is drives the mission of Jesus. That the identity of Jesus pushes Jesus into action. And then we're going to see, okay, if that's who Jesus is and this is his mission, what we believe about Jesus will then drive our mission here on this earth. And our leading thought as we go through Mark 8 is this. When we see Jesus for who he is, we see his mission for what it is. And Mark 8 is going to be a passage all about sight. It's going to be all about vision. It's going to be about seeing things physically clearly and seeing things spiritually clearly. So we pick up our story starting in Mark chapter 8, verse 22, where Mark writes this. And they, meaning Jesus and the disciples, came to Bethsaida. And some people brought to him a blind man, and they begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when Jesus, listen to this, had spit on this man's eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And Mark is a little repetitive here, right? This is our first blind guy we are coming into contact with in Mark. And Mark wants it to be known. No, this man is literally blind. Physically, he cannot see anything. And we've seen the pattern of Jesus' healings. We've seen a lot of times through the book of Mark, a desperate person in a desperate situation comes on behalf of themselves or on behalf of someone they love. And they bring him to Jesus and they come to Jesus and Jesus sees that person and he heals that person. And what kind of healing has it been each and every time up until this point? It's been miraculous. It's been instantaneous. It's been 100% effective. It's been a whole healing. Right? When the four men lowered their paralyzed friend down to the ground and said, Jesus, and Jesus said, get up and walk, the guy didn't hobble out and then go and pick up some physical therapy on the way home. Right? When he said, Jairus' daughter raised from the dead, the disciples didn't have to get down there and make sure her heart kept beating via CPR. It was whole. It was instantaneous. And that's the pattern we expect. But Mark continues. After Jesus spit on his eyes and, and he touched him, the man looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he opened his eyes and this man's sight was restored. He saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. And this is the only miracle in all of the gospels that actually takes place in stages. Right, we see Jesus go to the man once and then he starts out as blind. And then after the first touch, his sight is blurry. And then after the second touch, his sight will be perfectly clear. And so like, we're like, okay, Jesus, what's going on here? Like, did you just lack power in that one moment? Did you not spit enough in his eyes? as weird as that was. Did your power just misfire? Did you have to reload a little bit? No, but Jesus was doing this purposely. Like remember, these next stories are all about sight. They're all about vision. They're all about us seeing Jesus clearly. And Jesus is doing this for the sake of his disciples who are watching. Because Jesus has been walking these men along this whole time. 
And what he's teaching them is that their faith, their sight in seeing who Jesus is, is actually coming along in stages. Because think at this point, we probably assume the disciples should be pretty much all in. Right? They've seen Jesus do a lot of miraculous things. They've been by his side throughout this whole ordeal. But sometimes the disciples just don't get it. They just don't see things clearly. Right? They watch miracle after miracle after miracle. And then they're on a boat and a storm comes. And they're like, well, this is it. This is where we die, Jesus. And Jesus gets up and he calms the storm. They watch, G- he, they watch Jesus feed 5,000 people. Right? Miraculously. Just a couple loaves and just a few fish. But then a couple chapters later, when there's just 4,000 people now, they're like, Jesus... I don't think we can handle this one. Like, how are you actually going to do that? And Jesus, again, does it exactly like he says he was. And you would think he would be mad at the disciples. He would think, guys, come on, get it together. How many times do we have to show this to you? But Jesus isn't. He's so gracious that the disciples are on this spiritual journey. The disciples are seeing Jesus in stages. We'll see that they're blind at some points. We'll see that their vision is blurry. But one day, they are going to see Jesus clearly. And that's the beautiful part about Jesus. Right? And that's the culture we want to establish here at Rio. The fact that none of us have arrived. The fact that all of us are on this spiritual journey of trying to see Jesus as clearly as possible. Right? Some of us may be a little further ahead, but all of us are on this journey of how can we actually see Jesus clearly. That's why we want to explore through things like Alpha. That's why we want faith to be something that we don't have to figure out in isolation by ourselves We all come together in community through groups to see if we can see Jesus clearly. Because our hope and our only desire here at Rio is that all of us are just growing. That we're all on this path of how can I see Jesus clearly. And in classic Markan fashion, right, the story picks up. The story continues very quickly. After this miracle, the disciples and Jesus are already instantly off heading 25 miles north to this place called Caesarea Philippi. And this is going to be the climactic moment of this. This is the linchpin where the identity of Jesus meets the mission of Jesus. Jesus is going to look at the disciples and he's going to say, who do you say that I am? And remember, the whole point is when we see Jesus for who he is, we will see his mission and likewise our mission for what it is. So Mark 8 verse 27 says this, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi would be a weird place, an unlikely place for the first profession of Jesus as the Christ. It's a place that was chiefly non-Jewish. It was a place that actually has a very sad military history for Israel. Caesarea Philippi was where Antiochus IV gained a decisive victory over Egypt 200 years before this. And this battle would actually send Palestine and Israel into a 20-year war following the Maccabean Revolt. So these disciples would have known, hey, Jesus, this is not a great place of success for us as a people. But not just that. Caesarea Philippi was a place that was all about the gods of this world. Take a look at what it would have looked like back in this day. So you see these beautiful temples, right? And these are the gods of this world. On the far left, where am I? That was a temple built by Philip to Augustus. It was built to the emperor who they worshipped as a god. And it was actually built on the place, the grotto, as crazy as this is, they actually believed was the entrance to the underworld, right? There was so much water and it was so crazy and they were just like, they were kind of afraid of it. So they're like, we don't know what to do with this. So let's just make that the entrance to the underworld, which I get a little bit. I don't like caves. And as you move on, you have the court of Pan and the nymphs, right? Pan was the Greek god of the wild, the forest and the shepherds. His bottom half was that of a goat, and his top half was that of a man. And then you come to the temple of Zeus, and then you come to the court of the nemesis, the temple of the sacred goats. And finally, Pan gets his own temple as well. And if that wasn't enough, just in case they forgot anybody, you could see the little cubbies that they carved out in the cliff, and they could put whatever god that they might have forgotten to build a temple to, their statue there, so they could worship him too. So now imagine this. The disciples are being asked this question of who do they say Jesus is. In this moment, they're surrounded by a history of defeat. In this moment, their eyes are filled with a vision of every God that this world worships, of every God that this world has trusted. And Jesus comes to them. And at the end of verse 27, he he asks them, and he eases them into this. Jesus says, who do people say that I am? 
Right? Who does the crowd say that I am? And they said, all right, Jesus, well, you know, some say, you know, you're like John the Baptist, your predecessor. Others say like Elijah from the Old Testament. And others, see, they're just like, hey, he's just one of the prophets. And think about this. Mark is all about the crowd. We've seen the crowd play out all the time in the book of Mark. These people who flock to Jesus. These people who run after Jesus, chase Jesus. Jesus is forced in the boat just to get away from some of these people for his own safety. And the whole time, they don't see Jesus for who he is. They are blind to the fact that Jesus is not just another one of the prophets. He's not just this wise man who they can learn something from. He's not just this man that can fill their belly miraculously with bread. He's not just this man who can heal and they're blind to that fact. They're spiritually, their eyes are still blind. But then Jesus digs deeper and a little more personal. When he comes to the disciples, and he says, okay, not what do they say, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And Jesus strictly charged them to tell no one about it. Peter the brazen, Peter the bold, Peter the courageous, he gets it exactly right. He jumps in on behalf of all of the disciples, right? Peter's been given spiritual sight in this moment to see Jesus for who he actually is. Jesus is the anointed one. That's what Christ stands for. He's the Messiah, the long-awaited man that they have been waiting all of history for. And you can imagine the disciples are, you know, they're high-fiving, they're, they're jazzed. They're jacked up. They're like, Peter, thanks for covering that one for us. We weren't totally sure. Because who do they think this Messiah is going to be? Right? They're jazzed that Jesus is this Messiah. Because what do they hope in their heart of hearts that Jesus is going to do for them? Right? They hope that he's going to crush Rome. They hope that they're no longer going to be under Rome's thumb. That, that the Jews will finally have their own place in history that they'll finally be in charge, that they won't be oppressed, and that these guys have surrounded themselves with the man who's going to do it, and they're going to be in a place of prominence. They're excited to rule this earth alongside Jesus. But their sight quickly gets blurry. As Jesus continues to reveal what exactly that means, in verse 31 it says, And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man, who Jesus is, must suffer many things. And he must be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And Jesus is rehearsing for them his mission. right? The identity of Jesus and the mission of Jesus coming together into this chapter. And this is not the Messiah they expected. Not just that, but it's actually going to be the insiders, the religious elite. It's not going to be Rome and the outsiders who put Jesus to death, who make him suffer. But it's going to be the people who should see Jesus the clearest. Right, the scholars, the religious elite, the people who should have been waiting for exactly who Jesus is. But they don't see Jesus. Right? They're blind to the fact, they're spiritually blind that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, stands exactly in front of them. And we have to take a pause here. Because it's easy for us on, on this side of history as we look back at the cross. Because we see it as beautiful, we see it as victorious, we see it for exactly what it is. But what would these 12 men be thinking right here in this moment? Right? They wouldn't have put a cross around their neck. They wouldn't have hung a cross up in their home. Because the cross at this point was another form of Roman oppression. Right? The Messiah does not belong on it. And they must be thinking, Jesus, okay, why? Why do you have to die? Like you're at the peak of your ministry. Jesus, look how much power you have. You spit in a guy's eyes and now he can see why would we end all of this here what is all of this about and again we have to think about what have they seen in their lifetime well they've seen that jesus was not the first man to claim to be the messiah jesus was not the first person to step up on the scene and say that i am the messiah that you have been waiting for but what happened to each of those people who claimed to be the messiah How did it all end for them? Well, it ended with Rome putting their Messiah to death. Because in their eyes, a dead Messiah is no Messiah at all. They think Jesus is just going to be like another one, to come and go in death. You can imagine as they're listening, they're just thinking, man, we gave up everything for this guy. We left our homes We left our families, 
We left our good jobs. We left it all behind to follow this man who in the end is going to end up just like the rest of us. A dead Messiah who is no Messiah at all. In verse 32, it says, and Jesus said this plainly, right? Jesus, there's no more parables right now, just clear teaching about what's going on. And Peter, who just had spiritual sight, think about what's about to take place, took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your minds on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter's vision is blurry. It looked like it was clear, but the expectations that Peter have about Jesus being the Messiah are here. And they don't match what Jesus actually says about himself. Even Jesus is telling him what he must do. Peter rebukes and Peter cannot believe in a Messiah who would suffer. He cannot believe that this is the mission of Jesus' life. And now we kind of get why Jesus kept saying, hey, don't tell anyone about this. Right? Because the suffering Messiah is a stumbling block for the Jews. And it's a little wild that Jesus calls Peter Satan, right? Those aren't casual words that you throw around to a friend. Right? It's a, it's a pretty serious claim. Jesus doesn't say, hey, Peter, right now you're acting a lot like Satan. He doesn't say, hey, Peter, right now you're thinking thoughts like Satan. No, he looks at him and says, you are Satan. And why does he do this? What is Peter trying to do? Right, what is Satan's only hope in this world for victory? I know it's a little weird to think from Satan's perspective. Let's not do that often. Right, but Satan's only hope is that Jesus, the eternal son of God, who is the Messiah, never suffers. His only hope that Jesus is comfortable enough in his powerful position here on earth to never suffer, to never die, to never go to the cross. Because the cross is where sin and death and Satan will be defeated forever. So Satan wants nothing to do with Jesus getting there, and he sees Peter as an option for that. And just as we thought, you know, calling Peter Satan and talking about all this, but Jesus isn't done yet, though. Because as we've been Moving along, remember, the identity of Jesus drives the mission of Jesus. And now Jesus is going to look at us and the disciples and the crowd, and he says, your identity of who you believe I am will affect your mission here on this earth. And it says in verse 34, and Jesus calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And you have to think, if Peter had a PR team at this point, or if Jesus had a PR team at this point, they would be livid, right? This is not the kind of state, statement that wins you friends and influences people. Right? It's a serious, it's a somber call. And it's not just a call for the religious elite. It's not just a call for the disciples. It's not just a call for professional Christians or ordained pastors. But you see, at this moment, it's not just the disciples. But Jesus calls everybody who is there. He says, if anyone would come after he says, if anyone wants to follow me, if any of you want to become my people, if any of you want to enter into the family of God, if any of you want to call yourselves Christians, here's what you must do. Here's your new purpose. He says, first, you must deny yourself. And I, and I think that's fascinating. Because if Jesus said, hey, you know what you need to deny in this life? All the bad stuff. You know what you need to deny? You know that sin that keeps clinging to you? Hey, just deny that. You know, all the evil stuff in this world, all the darkness. Hey, why don't you just deny that and that's enough? No, but Jesus looks at them and says, no, the main issue in our lives is us. Right? As hard as that is to hear, he's not saying, hey, sin is just something that's out there in the world. But sin is actually inside of each and every one of us. And it affects each and every one of us that your nature is sinful. And what else does denying yourself look like? Right, in a world where... The first and the last filter is how it's going to affect us, right? Hey, if I spend my time this way, what kind of effect is it going to have on me? Hey, if I spend my money like this, how will this affect me? How will this affect my future? Right? If I align myself with these people, what is my reputation going to look like? If Jesus say, no, it's not about you anymore. You are no longer the first and last filter in your life. There's something bigger. There, there, there's something greater than you. And a cross? I was thinking, Jesus, a cross. Man, that's where the rapists go. Hey, that's where the thieves go. That's where the murderers go. That's where Rome kills people very, very slowly for crimes that they have 
commit it. The cross isn't an efficient, efficient instrument of killing, right? It's meant to elongate that person's suffering so they are punished the most they possibly can be. You want us to pick up that? You want us to take up our cross? And that's not what we want to hear from the mouth of Jesus about our mission here on this earth. Right? And Jesus could have stopped there. He could have hit, hit that period. And he could have just said, okay, go. But he's not. Remember, he's gracious to us. And he actually explains to us why. Right? He takes his time to look at the disciples, to look at the crowd, and to look at us and say, okay, this is why. Verse 35 says, forever would save his life, will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For if he is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Right, this is a sober warning for all of us today. Right, but it's going to be beautiful in the end. Just, just work with me here as we go. And I think it, in order to understand this, I think it's easiest if we work backwards. So let's start at verse 38 and work our way back through the line. Jesus says at the end, Forever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. So what's the opposite of being ashamed? Right, it's being proud. It's wanting to be seen. It's wanting to be identified with. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying, hey, there's going to come a day in the end that, that, that is going to make this life look like nothing. That this is not the end of your life. There's going to come a day of judgment. And on that day, it matters what you think about who I am. It matters that if you look at the life of Jesus, if you look at the cross, if you think it's all foolish and if you think it's, it's nothing and worthless, if you're ashamed to be seen with Jesus because of his mission here on this earth, if you're so absorbed by the point of this world and all the money and all of the power that you forget about Jesus, in the end, Jesus will be ashamed of you. And that's serious. And just as a caveat, Jesus isn't saying, you know, there's moments in all of our lives when we just bobble it, right? There's moments in all of our lives where, where our friend, a coworker, someone in our life tees us up to share the gospel. Right? They, they're talking about some tragedy in their life and, and how they're hopeless and they just don't have it. And you know the gospel. You know that Jesus came to save that person in front of you and you just think, no, not, that's not for me today. Because what are they going to think about me? Will this hurt my work relationships? Will, will family dinners be awkward from here on out? Jesus isn't talking about that because we all do that. Right? It stinks that we all do it, but we do. Right? Jesus is saying, in the end, is your heart settled on being ashamed of me? In the end, is your heart settled on being embarrassed by me? And we continue moving to verse 37, right? We're working backwards. Jesus says, for what can a man give in return for his soul? And this is a statement veiled in a question. Right? Jesus is making it clear. You do not have any power to buy back your own soul. All of the sin, all of the trouble, all of the misery, the only hope you have is that a third party, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, steps in on your behalf. And Jesus continues, verse 36, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? It's not just that you can't do it yourself. It's that all of the things around you, all of the things of this earth can't do it for you. You can be the richest, you can be the prettiest, you can be the most powerful, you can be the most successful. But in the end, when Jesus returns, none of that can buy back your soul. If you're ashamed of Jesus and embarrassed by Jesus. And finally, Jesus says, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Think about what Jesus is saying. Right, back to denying yourself, back to taking up your cross, back to sacrificing your earthly life for the good and for the betterment of something greater. For Jesus. Because nothing here on this earth can save us. Right? There's no hope in anything that we can see with our earthly eyes. There's no hope in anything we can pick up and touch and feel. Jesus is making it clear that you're not hopeless, but there's a greater hope than even what you're putting your hope in. There's a hope in Jesus that never fails as the Messiah. And here's a beautiful part, which I promised I'm going to fulfill. Right, because this is, this is a sober warning that this is pretty serious and I feel it. Right, but here's the beautiful part. Jesus is not asking us to walk a path that he won't walk himself. 
Right, that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, looked at us, broken and miserable as we are, with a history of just messing things up. And he looked at people who can't save themselves, and he says, okay, I'm going to step in on their behalf. I'm going to leave heaven, right, I'm going to take on flesh, I'm going to take on skin, I'm going to take on bones. I'm going to live life in the full humanity. I'm going to eat, I'm going to sleep, I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. And I'm going to live a life that all of these people can't live themselves. I'm going to do everything perfectly. I'm going to obey my father at every step of the way. And his story doesn't end with this ruling on earth, but it ends with what? It ends with one of his friends betraying him for some silver. It ends with an army coming to take him while he's praying. And then he gets shifted around from person to person, and they just can't seem to do what they want to do with him. So they torture him and they beat him. And the eternal son of God doesn't speak up. He doesn't send angels to save himself. And eventually, he literally picks up his cross. A cross that's so heavy because he's so broken and battered that he can't even walk to Golgotha himself. And then they're going to lay that cross down. Right Then the eternal son of God, who's fully God and fully man, will be laid on it. And nail after nail, torture device after torture device... The eternal son of God is going to be hung on a tree. And why? And here's the beautiful part. Jesus finds our souls far more precious and far more valuable than we do. Because we look at the things of this world and we just want to give our souls and we're like, oh, a little bit more money and I'll finally be satisfied. Or a little bit more power and I'll finally be satisfied. And we'll sell our eternal souls for things that are finite, for things that will disappear. And Jesus says, no, you are far more valuable than you lend yourself to be. That your soul is so valuable in Jesus' mind that he would die for it. That your worth is not just of who you are or what you do, but your worth is how far Jesus would go to be with you. And don't you think this is what our world needs right now? Right in a broken, in a divided, in a dark world. Right, our world doesn't need Christians who, yeah, I got Jesus in my left hand, but, you know, I got the political power in my right hand. Jesus doesn't say, hey, Jesus, I I love you, but you're like number three on the list. The first two are definitely my success here on earth, and the second one is definitely my bank account. Right, no, What this world needs is Christians who forget everything of this earth, who deny themselves, who who sacrifice themselves and take up their cross and everything that this earth stands for. Because what happens when we do that? A watching world sees that our hope is far greater than anything that this world can offer. Our hope is far greater than the darkness, that there is a light that can shine in all of this. Lives that say, hey, my hope is in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, alone. And people notice that. (laughs) This world will have to notice it. And this is what the early church did. Where are we going to end here? But the early church, right, our our world hasn't gotten worse necessarily. (laughs) The early church was a broken world, right? It was a fractured world. It was a world where if you weren't Roman and praying to Roman gods, you were nothing in this life. But the early church in the first and second centuries, man, they denied themselves. They picked up their cross. And and just here's a couple of quotes to describe this. This is from Lucian of Samosata, right? He was a Greek writer in the second century, right? He pretty much hated religion at all costs. And this is what he says. He says, the poor wretches, he's talking about Christians, have convinced themselves that they are going to be immortal and live for all time. They mock death and even willingly give themselves into custody. Most of them. Furthermore, their first lawgiver, Christ, persuaded them that they are all brothers of one another after they have transgressed once for all by denying the Greek gods and by worshiping that crucified sage himself and living under his laws. The next one is Trajan um, became the Roman emperor around 98 AD. And he writes this about Ignatius of Antioch around 108 AD. Trajan says about Ignatius, We command that Ignatius, who affirms that he carries about within him, him being Jesus, that was crucified, be bound by soldiers and carried to the great city Rome, there to be devoured by the beasts. Why? For the gratification of the people. 
And upon hearing this sentence, and I don't know how he could say this, Ignatius cried out, I thank you, O Lord. Because his hope wasn't in this earth. His hope wasn't in a nice, pretty, easy retirement. His hope was in the mission of Jesus for denying himself so that the gospel can be spread. And here we are still talking about him. It worked. And when his Roman brethren heard that he was going to take this route, he says this to them, which gets even better. He says, brethren, do not hinder me from this. When I suffer, I shall be the freed man of Jesus and shall rise again emancipated in him. All the pleasures of the world and all the kingdoms of this earth shall profit me nothing. Him I seek who died for us. Him I desire who rose again for our sake. This is the gain which, which is laid up for me. And that's the man who took the call of Jesus seriously. And he does not seem any bit disappointed by it. The early church saw Jesus for who he is. Right? And remember the theme of the day. Because Mark is trying to tell us when we see Jesus for who he is as God, we see his mission for what it is as beautiful. Right? And here's a couple of questions and then we're done. First one, who would you say that Jesus is today? Right? And answer it today. I know we're all on a spiritual journey, but you're allowed to answer in the midst of a journey. Secondly, where in your life do you need to come back to the call of Jesus? Where do you see a place where maybe you've made yourself a little bit too big and you've forgotten about the call of Jesus? Where do you need to die yourself? Where do you need to take up your cross and where do you need to follow him? And like we say every week, hey, we're all on a spiritual journey. I, I said that. But man, if today, if something hit, don't, don't wait for it to pass. Jesus didn't give Peter 24 hours to answer the question. He asked him in that moment, and Peter had to answer in the midst of a journey, maybe without knowing all of how this is going to end. So maybe today it's time to take a step of faith. And that's why people are always down here at the end. Right at the end of the service, people are down here. If you need to pray, if you need to talk, if you have questions, right, please come talk to us. Don't, don't let today pass. But I'm going to pray for us, and Ryan will lead us into communion. Our Father and our God, Lord. Um, we come to you just thankful for who you are. Thankful that we can say that you are God and we can trust that you are God and we can give you control because you are God. Jesus, we just praise you that, that you're a God who doesn't just sit idly by, that you didn't just create this world and walk away, but, but that you meet us here, that you meet us in this very place right now, that your presence is tangible, that your presence is near. So, Lord, we just ask for your spirit in this moment. Lord, for all of us sitting in this room, Lord, would your spirit just fall? Would you convict us of where we've gone awry in all of this? Would you convict us of where we've made this life all about us? Would you convict us of how we run to the things of this world to satisfy our soul when, when you're sitting here with a megaphone screaming that you love us and you care about us too much to let us fall into that? So, Lord, we just ask now that we would also feel your grace. That you're a God who's generous, that you're a God who's patient, that you're a God who's gracious. That you're a God who, who went to the lengths of death on a cross to save us.